was a joke. A Kentucky Fried Chicken Choke. Talking big game, flapping my gums. Never got around to getting nothing done. I was a freak. Couldn't even get along. I Hate Politics is a podcast dedicated to exploring a human activity we love to hate. We look at human life, culture, and economics closest to us, in our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools and streets, and in our local governments. Together, we will explore how politics is central to getting things done in societies where we treasure diverse views and preferences. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. I've spent my life studying politics, and I know this. Unless we want to live in a dictatorship or monarchy, we are stuck with politics. Politics is more than Trump, Biden, or elections. It's how we fix potholes, make our streets safer, where we put our schools and decide who goes to them. It's about coming together as a community. It's about us. Let's go find those stories. In this episode, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan's plan to widen and add toll lanes to Interstate 270, the biggest arterial highway that goes through Montgomery County, comes up against local opposition. The governor has been forced to shrink his original plan to toll the entire Capitol Beltway passing through Maryland all the way up on 270 to Frederick and even the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. What remains is a roughly 20-mile stretch from the American Legion Bridge that connects Virginia and Maryland over the Potomac River to Shady Grove, which is the northernmost station on the Washington metro system. At a rally in Rockville, the jurisdiction that would be most affected by the highway expansion, local leaders laid out a long list of complaints over the roar of I-270. We will hear out these arguments, but a few weeks ago, I had the chance to talk with one of the main organizers of the rally, Ben Ross, who is the chair of Maryland Transit Opportunities Coalition and a longtime transit advocate over highways and toll lanes. In this episode, we use new music from the Airport 77s, a 70s power pop and classic new wave band from Silver Spring. Andy Sullivan on guitar, Chuck Dolan on bass, and John Kelly on drums. Vocals I can't tell yet, but I will find out. They are coming out of pandemic performance lockdown at Sligo Creek Golf Course the day this episode releases, which is June 11th, 2021, at 6 p.m. Their newest album, Rotation, is available on Spotify. In the news this week, the state of Maryland's unemployment insurance system, the Beacon, was in turmoil this week. Andrew Sondry has a story. This past Sunday, when all those on unemployment went to file their weekly certification, hundreds of people statewide found that they just couldn't do so. Later the afternoon, the Department of Labor posted on its social media that some recipients had reached the 52 weeks that they're allowed under federal law and had to reapply to continue getting benefits, something that they weren't warned about, which is what the department typically does when there is that kind of an update coming. Uh, The problem here is that a lot of the people hadn't actually been on unemployment for 52 weeks, uh, so they shouldn't have gotten this request in the first place. But Governor Hogan, just told people that all they needed to do was go into the system and click on the apply for benefits button, which is under action items. But many of people couldn't get into the beacon portal at all. And those who could weren't always presented with that button. Those who were able to get in and who did get that button got a lot of paperwork and had some difficulty uploading the documents that they needed into the system, which many of them uh, were posting a lot about on social media. There are a couple of these pages where people were just talking about all the chaos that this had wrought. 
uh, you know, some folks still aren't able to access the system and haven't been so since Sunday, but Hogan keeps brushing it off. Does this have to do with the governor's um, proposal to end the $300 additional benefits by July 3rd? Yeah, it does, but it, it's bigger than that. The end of the benefits caused a bit of a crush, a lot of people applying all at the same time. Uh, and so the system was essentially overburdened on several fronts. In sleeper news from the 2021 Maryland General Assembly session, a new law was passed striking HOA lawn rules. Homeowners can now grow native plants, build butterfly gardens. Lawns are among the worst uses of open land, and many of them are maintained with fertilizers that run off into the Chesapeake Bay and endanger aquatic life. The law not just protects the environment and the Chesapeake Bay, but also is a step toward undoing the HOA stranglehold on how housing works. Maryland Department of Natural Resources and local nonprofits, Maryland Coastal Bays Program, and the Maryland D.C. Audubon Society have launched a 1,000-square-foot floating platform into the Chesapeake Bay. The island comes with decoy birds and bird sound makers to attract the common and royal terns, which have become endangered as a result of natural sandbars disappearing from the bay. The terns use these small islands for nesting. Maine, the state of Maine, use these floating platforms to bring back the puffin. For more on this, Go to PBS NewsHour from June 6th. Santos Yul Gonzalez, 23, a pedestrian who was struck and killed on University Boulevard in Montgomery County on September 5th, 2020, was reported in the police crash report as being in an unmarked crosswalk. But the collision investigation report found that he was not in a crosswalk. This raises an important question about whether the reporting on crashes is adequately organized to discover facts and whether police personnel, in particular, are adequately trained to take these reports, which are then used for determining who is at fault for pedestrian deaths and subsequent charges as necessary. State House Delegate Carol Resnick did some research on the social media reach of Maryland governor candidates. Tom Perez has a quarter million Twitter followers, followed by Wes Moore at 57,000 and John King at 29,000. Russian Baker and Peter Francho are at 12 and 10,000 respectively. But Wes Moore leads in Facebook and Instagram, followed by Tom Perez. In county election news, a new elected position is now open. Longtime Montgomery County Sheriff Darren Popkin has decided not to seek re-election. For those who don't know, the Sheriff's Department in Montgomery County is separate from the Montgomery County Police Department and runs the county jails and holds prisoners in custody. A coalition of students and social justice groups organized a rally for police-free schools in Silver Spring recently. They were particularly unhappy with County Executive Mark L. Rich's proposal to move school resource officers, or SROs, from inside of school buildings to the outside and placing them in the community. Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich has submitted a letter to Washington Metro requesting that the White Flint station on the red line be renamed North Bethesda. North Bethesda is the preferred real estate moniker for the area between Bethesda and Rockville, and its use is widely ridiculed as striving. To pay for the name change, the state will pay $250,000, the county another $50,000, and the rest will come from property owners expected to benefit from the upgrade. If County Executive Elrich is listening, I have a small proposal that we rename 
the Rockville metro station, Rock of Asia. If you are ever up this way, Rockville has some of the best Chinese, Korean, and possibly Vietnamese cuisine, including various regional variations. I'll be back with the Don't Widen 270 rally and much more. Transit not told. Transit not told. Transit not told. Transit not told. That's Senator Will Smith Jr. leading the chant in Rockville on June 8th. Earlier in the morning, the Maryland Tolling Authority under Governor Hogan approved a contract with two Australian toll road companies giving them the right to develop toll lanes from the American Legion Bridge all the way up on I-270 to Frederick the county to the north of Montgomery. The notice of the Maryland Tolling Authority meeting came out in Washington Post on Friday night, June 4th, and 150 people gathered on Tuesday at noontime in the heat and cicadas within earshot of the highway. The contract opens a 30-day period of public review, and the agreement includes a clause that will reimburse the company $50 million dollars if for some reason the state does not okay the project and sign the toll lane development contract with the two firms. Earlier in May, the Maryland Department of Transportation under Hogan had reduced the scope of its highway widening proposal to exclude expansion of I-495, the Capitol Beltway, because of opposition from residents whose homes and neighborhoods would be affected. The Don't Widen 270 protesters We're hoping the governor will drop widening plans for 270 as well, at least for now. The federal environmental impact study has not been completed, and with the new federal infrastructure spending, there are questions about whether it is necessary to do a P3 anymore. P3 is jargon for private-public partnership, which in this case promised Maryland taxpayers a no-fiscal-cost highway expansion in return for turning over tolls to the private companies for the next 50 years. Let's start with Rockville Mayor Bridget Newton talking about the impact it'll have on the city of Rockville, the jurisdiction most impacted by the proposal. Originally named the I-270-495 Traffic Relief Plan, the plan was to consider transformative solutions for users including improvements to highway and transit. The plan is now being rushed to a vote. It's hardly transformative, and they have excised the transit. The city of Rockville will be the most adversely impacted municipality in this project. Nine neighborhoods about I-270, two churches, two nursing homes, two child care early learning centers, Julius West Middle School, the Rockville Senior Center, all the Cabin John watershed. I could go on and on. Who's going to pay for this folly when we have no alternative? What will the tolls be? They've not been decided yet. I want something that would be socially just, environmentally sound, and fiscally supported by federal County government. Executive Mark Elrich, a veteran of highway fights, was up next. About the only thing the governor's gotten right so far is realizing that if you're going to fix a problem, you start at the choke point. And so starting at the American Legion Bridge makes a hell of a lot more sense than starting at the back of the line. If you unplug the American Legion Bridge, then you get to see how the thing changes going forward. But starting at the back of the line was a serious mistake. That's the one thing he got right. There's a whole bunch of other stuff he didn't get right. Virginia is disincentivized to using transit or doing anything to reduce vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gases. And so this... Virginia is not going to be a partner in putting transit across that bridge if it affects their relationship with Transurban. It is antithetical to any efforts to reduce greenhouse gases to do a project that's pretty much solely going to be a road project. That's one of the first problems. The second thing is this is not needed. There is no need for two lanes in each direction. I was on the council when Governor O'Malley came in and Sydney was there too. And Nova Mali proposed the same thing, two lanes in each direction. The council said two reversible lanes down the middle. You don't have to widen it. It gives you two lanes in the peak direction. What he's going to wind up doing is creating two lanes on both sides 
Those two lanes might be used four hours a day. The other 20 hours a day, you'd be out of your mind to come to Rockville and pay a toll in the morning. I do this every day. I would never get in the toll lane going north in the morning. And the same thing in the evening. I don't need a toll lane going south in the evening. I, the, the traffic jam is going north. So he's created an overly expensive solution, something we don't need. You begin to wonder after a while, is the government committed to sensible traffic relief, including transit, or is the governor only interested in creating a P3? Why has he blown up the price of this project so much that it's out of reach of the state unless they have a P3 partner? This is one of the serious mistakes about this. Adding rail is a real option. O'Malley talked about this, the ability to strengthen the rail that runs from Western Maryland and comes down here. We need a bi-directional system. We should put a track in. It would take people off the road. Combined with reversible lanes, we wouldn't be talking about this nonsense. And it would also be way cleaner. Think of all the emissions that would get taken off the road from people coming from Cumberland and Hagerstown trying to get into D.C. So instead of doing something sensible, he's not willing to do it. Finally, if you're going to do this, you've got to go all the way up to Frederick. It is insane to start stop the northbound track at the ICC. Anybody, you know, you get on the Beltway, try to merge on the Beltway from the 270 spur. The traffic backs up just from one lane trying to merge on the Beltway. Now picture two high-speed lanes trying to merge onto I-270 when you take those lanes away at the end of the day. It's nuts, it's irresponsible, and it's just flat out wrong. Finally. The thing that drives me crazy about Republicans sometimes is you want them to actually be physically responsible and then they won't do it anyway. And so here's a case where, unlike the previous president, you have a president and a transportation secretary who believe in infrastructure. You have a road that connects the west and western Maryland and the north via the American Legion Bridge and the Beltway to 95 South. That bridge is going to not be serviceable in 10 to 15 years. It's going to need replacement. Why aren't we going to the federal government first? Whatever excuse you had for not dealing with Trump, not going to the Biden administration, not saying we have a perfect project that meets your criteria, it links an interstate system together, it deals with congestion, and oh, by the way, you can do the driving part of it, except for the bridge, pretty easily. Instead of doing that, he insists on a P3. Before you do anything, and I've asked um, Comptroller Francho, who also likes to be fiscally conservative, that he should stand up and say, before we do this as a P3, let's try to get the money out of the federal government. It's a perfect project. It's the responsible thing to do. I will continue to fight this. And, and I am not going to sign off on anything that's any more than the two reversibles down the middle. I'm not bringing this next to your schools. I'm not bringing this next to your neighborhoods. And I'm not going to make a mess out of this any more than it already is. Few people can say no as well as Mark Elrich. Up next was County Council President Tom Hucker. Let me tell you what we do want. This is what I told Secretary Pete. We want a true multimodal mobility plan. And that starts with transit. We have a transit first policy in Montgomery County, Prince George's County and DC. That's where we start. We have six at least transit projects that have been studied, been approved, prioritized by the county leadership and then not funded by the state year after year. So what are they? They include the Corridor City's Transit Way to connect the up county residents in Clarksburg and Germantown down to the Shady Grove Metro and get them on the red line so they don't have to drive and they're not in front of us here on 270. It includes expansion of Mark Rail. How in the world does the nation's capital have a rinky-dink little commuter rail that goes one way in the morning and one way in the evening? Does that make any sense? We're the nation's capital. We need a first-class commuter rail as well, just like just about every major metropolitan area on the East Coast. And third, we need a lot more bus rapid transit. We've stood it up on US 29 in my district from, deep, from uh, Silver Spring up to Burtonsville, and it's going great. And it's really in, improved the ridership there. But we've had to pay for it all with your county tax dollars. The state didn't put in a penny. So that's a big problem, except for one little Tiger Grant. But for running it, it's all us. We have three other lines we've, been to, we've approved, and we've been prioritizing Sydney for a long time. Running buses up 355, 
all the way from Friendship Heights, Bethesda, all the way to Clarksburg, right? Running them here to Rockville from Wheaton across the two lakes of the Red Line to connect to Rockville up the Earth Mill Road. And a third, a third additional unfunded line in Great Seneca Science Corridor to take people from downtown Rockville through the employers on the west side of Rockville and Gaithersburg and up to the Shady Grove Metro. So people and all those employers don't have to drive to work. They can take, they can take BRT to the Red Line. We also need to expand the Purple Line if they ever pick a construction firm to finish it. And we need to expand the red line as well. That's transit. Second leg of the school, transportation demand management. Many of you proved you can get your jobs done over Zoom over the last year, right? And I bet you want to keep doing that at least one or two days a week. So transportation demand management means giving employers incentive to keep people home and off the road. And if we give people options so they can take transit number one and they can stay home number two and work, that takes a lot of cars off the road. Then the third leg of the school is you minimal, make the minimal improvements in the road once you've gotten all the cars possible off the roads. We need a new American Legion bridge and the Fed should pay for it, no question. But we don't even know what we need yet until we get as many cars off the road as possible. That's the third leg of the school. The fight against highways is hardly new. Faced with opposition from affluent and well-organized communities, the interstate system which was built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was rammed through poor and often black neighborhoods that forever destroyed those communities and created a car-dependent housing and transportation system that has, in the end, been a disaster for the climate. The protesters and speakers at the Don't Widen 270 rally were also still mostly white. State Senator Will Smith Jr. was the only speaker of color. What has changed, however, is the explicit recognition that future transportation projects must not make the mistakes of the past. The new federal infrastructure spending includes grants to undo the damage that has been done before. In a Reuters report by Andy Sullivan, who also happens to be the guitarist, in the Airport 77s, our band for this week, Syracuse in New York is taking down parts of Interstate 81 that has divided the black community in the city for decades. Ben Ross, one of the organizers of the Don't Widen 270 rally, talked with me a few weeks ago. The audio of that interview wasn't very good and I was hoping to redo our chat. But with these new developments and the growing opposition to the I-270 expansion, we need some history and context now. Ben Ross, welcome to I Hate Politics. Really glad to be here. The Maryland Department of Transportation recently announced that it was reducing its scope of the project of the highway uh, and toll lane expansion that it had planned and that it was dropping m most of the Beltway ex uh, expansion, but keeping the uh, project in place from the American Legion Bridge through Shady Grove, uh, mostly on Interstate 270. What happened? Well, I think they ran into uh, too much opposition. It's that simple. So what is the project before and what is the project now? How did they change the scope? The project was all of I-270 and the Beltway from the American Legion Bridge all the way around to Branch Avenue in Prince George's County. Uh, now they've taken out almost all of the Beltway and it's the American Legion Bridge the little bit of the beltway to the split with 270, just past River Road, and then up I-270. And exactly how far that goes uh, depends uh, which process you're in, because they're letting a contract for I-270 all the way up to Frederick, but their environmental study, which needs which needs to be done for federal approval to use the interstate, uh, goes only as far as Shady Grove. Uh, and I'm very skeptical that they will ever extend it past Shady Grove because north of Shady Grove, it's a big money loser. 
even according to them who are very optimistic about the finances. All right, let's talk about the history. You said that this the project was even bigger than this. What did it include? Yeah, it went all the way to the uh, Wilson Bridge, and it also included the uh, BW Parkway all the way up to Baltimore. Why did they drop that part of it early? The BW Parkway was dropped uh, because the federal government, National Park Service, owns the BW Parkway, and they would have had to turn it over to the uh, state and uh, needed permission from Congress. And both the Park Service and the uh, Maryland congressional delegation basically said no way. What is the argument for having more highway lanes? Uh, you know, the, the argument is that uh, widening the road will uh, get rid of the congestion and that the economy needs it. Uh, but it, that just doesn't hold up under any kind of examination. Why does it not hold up? Well, there's two parts of that. One is the congestion relief. If you look at the current plan, uh, what it's going to do is right now you have all the northbound congestion, the worst northbound congestion on 270 mm -hmm. is at the lane merges. Correct. So what this plan will do is instead of merging six lanes into two lanes, you're going to merge seven lanes into two lanes. So your primary concern is an engineering concern that their plan does not do what it promises to do, which is to reduce traffic congestion. The other concern is that it takes our whole transportation policy in the wrong direction. Okay. Uh, you know, the demand, the uh, need now is for more transit, not mm -hmm. for more highways, but it locks us into a transit dependent, a highway dependent mode of transportation. And uh, even more so because it's privatized, because what you're doing is you're setting up this company, private company, to have a stranglehold on the state's transportation policy. You know, the road gets built where it's most profitable, not where it's most needed. And and actually, this proposal is the perfect example of that because it's uh, connecting, you know, you're building a highway between McLean and Great Falls to Potomac and West Bethesda. Uh, you know, that's going to be... That's where all the people who can afford the high tolls live. Mm -hmm. So that's where the highway gets built. And then there's no guarantee of ever getting highways where the people who can't afford the high tolls live. Relatively, are the obstacles fewer in the reduced scope than they were before? Oh, yeah. They've gotten rid of some big obstacles. I mean, the, uh, Walter, the Navy at uh, Bethesda Navy Hospital... They needed land, and the Navy wrote them a letter and said, no way are you getting our land. Hmm. Um, so, yes, the, the, and, and then there were tremendous costs of uh, relocating uh, water and sewer pipes in the Rock Creek Valley. Uh, right. So, yes, I mean, those... You know, they're, they're getting rid of those obstacles. Are there any more obstacles of similar magnitude, like the Navy or uh, Rock Creek uh, sewer system uh, that remain in the project right now? This Plumber's Island, the biology research, is a big one. Uh, and they are uh, limited on the other side of the highway by the naval ship uh, channel. Is it possible that they will at some point just reduce the entire project to the American Legion Bridge and, you know, say, oh, it's too difficult to do 270. Or do you think the American Legion Bridge will not be fixed rather than maybe they'll do the 270 part? Well, that's a, a very interesting question because when they advertised their solicitation, that's basically what they said, that the first stage would only be the American Legion Bridge. Then there would be a second stage of uh, building uh, on 270 from the Beltway to Shady Grove. Mm -hmm. 
And then once they've completed a f future environmental study for the feds, there would be a third stage from uh, Shady Grove to Frederick. Okay. So uh, now what happened was that tra uh, Transurban came in and Can you said, explain no, who Transurban is? Yeah, Transurban is the Australian company that owns the toll lanes on the Beltway in Virginia uh, and on I-95 in Virginia. Just to clarify, and you think that this is just an expansion of those lanes for, for in, into Maryland and further on as much as it'll go? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, clearly their goal. They've just uh, sold a part interest in what they own there in Virginia with a price that is clearly based on the buyer's belief that it will be, that this thing will get a lot bigger. They have been stepping out stage by stage in Virginia and uh, they clearly want to extend into Maryland. My understanding of 270 is that the, the real traffic congestion is up on the northern half of it. And that the bottom half being a 12-lane highway, there's not that much congestion. And you are saying that they are not going to touch the northern half, right? The claim is that they will ultimately extend the toll lanes all the way to Frederick. But the way the contract works, Transurban only has to do that if they can make money on it or if the state subsidizes them enough to make money. And, uh, you know, everyone agrees that it won't make money on its own. Okay. Um, all right, let's talk transit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> much, um, better part, much more pleasant topic. <laughs> but the way, the, but, you know, we talk about highways because they are, they are real. This is a real problem. And people, yeah. in order to make up their minds, we need information about, you know, what on earth is going on here? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I didn't say it's a, it's an important topic, but not the most pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are your alternatives to American Legion Bridge, to 270, to 490, 495? What, what are your alternatives? Let me start by saying this, that the best place to put a highway is not the best place to put a transit line. Um, so this is really... The, the uh, toll lane project, as the governor said, is really designed to be a transformative project that affects the uh, transportation system of all of central Maryland. And so you, what you have to compare it with is an equally comprehensive transit plan that serves the same overarching goals and it won't necessarily serve the exact same trips. Uh, so what we think the alternative is uh, in the 270 corridor is the primary alternative is to put another track on the train line that goes to Frederick, the Mark trains, so that trains would run all day both ways and more frequently in rush hour. And that would be the alternative for people traveling, uh, you know, down 270 to Silver Spring, uh, to Bethesda, because you can change to the red line in Rockville, and it, and people going into D.C. Uh, and also, it would also uh, relieve a lot of uh, help a lot a lot of trips within Montgomery County that don't have good transit alternatives right now. Uh, because you'd be able to take the train, the Mark train, directly from Rockville to Silver Spring, which is only a you know 15-minute trip by train. And um, you know it, it, the current rush hour service on Mark really isn't useful for that. But if it was running all day both ways, it would be very useful. Uh, and then it also stops in Kensington. It stops in uh, Old Town Gaithersburg. Uh, it, uh, there are plans to build a station in uh, White Flint. So that would become you know, another trunk line for the county's uh, transit system. And you know, to me, it would really uh, 
help people get around the county much more than two more lanes on 270. But that's just north-south movement. What about east-west? Well, the purple line is under construction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that will, you know, give people a fast, good alternative for lots and lots of trips that are now forced onto the Beltway. The uh, But the Purple Line is not crossing over to Virginia. I mean, it's a yeah. Maryland project. Right. Uh, but in the long run, that would make sense. Uh, it's, it's an expensive project, not the fr- you know much more expensive than adding another track to the mark line, but it would make sense. And it's got a history. It was looked at when the purple line was first being studied. They looked at all sorts of possible alignments over the Potomac. Uh, and they found the most natural alignment is to continue the purple line east from Bethesda, uh, west from Bethesda, and uh, go under the, you know, tunnel under the uh, Potomac at Little Falls, uh, because that's easy to tunnel because there's rock right up to the surface. And then you come out on the other lo- side and there's a wide median in uh, Route 123 that you can go right up to Tyson's. Uh, so you draw that line on the map and they saw the train line, the tunnel goes directly under the CIA. So they said, oops, <laughs> um, but they, uh, next to the CIA is the Federal Highway Administration, and they talked to the Federal Highway Administration, and, you know, the Federal Highway Administration is engineers, and so the engineers' uh, reaction was, oh, this is a neat construction project, uh, and uh, that never became part of the Purple Line, the You know, the project we have already is clearly the best, you know, the first segment to go. Uh, But, uh, you know, there there are really two alternatives for getting over the Potomac. One is to tunnel under Little Falls, and the other is to uh, go along 270. And it needs to be studied uh, really to explore the advantages and disadvantages of, of each. Just for argument's sake, if we took the purple line and, and send it over, over uh, on a bridge um, by, say, the American Legion Bridge, would uh, the Plumber's Island still be affected? And that's one of the issues that has to be looked at between the two. The uh, park and planning is saying in their uh, comments is that the new bridge if there's a new bridge, it must be built to carry a, a rail line hmm. uh, structurally. So you could just lay the tracks and the bridge would be strong enough to hold them. And that's what was done when they built the, the new Woodrow Wilson Bridge. That has two lanes that are not in use that were built to carry rail. Would you support that? Yeah, sure. I mean, so they would be a bridge. Well, nobody's calling for not having a bridge. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure that it needs to be rebuilt right now. I mean, I think it the, the impetus, as I understand it, it has, if you're not trying to widen it, it has uh, 10 or 20 years left before you, at least before you would need to replace it. I have a question about Virginia. So Virginia is clearly part of the um, conversation uh, when we're talking about anything that has, you know, any uh, movement west of the Purple Line. And Virginia has been very strongly rail motivated, as well as highway motivated, of course. Uh, they've been very transportation motivated. So um, do, are they at all thinking about this or um, it's it's not, it's a total pipe dream right now? I don't see a lot of thought about that in Virginia right now, of, about extend, uh, you know, a, a rail connection over uh, the Potomac from Montgomery County. Um, you know, they're concentrated on widening the the bridge from D.C., the rail bridge from D.C., which is clearly the correct first priority for them. Uh, and I think part of their problem is that by getting into this P3 arrangement, 
the uh, P, the uh, private company has so much influence over their policy that they're being dragged by the private company as much as they're telling the private company what they want. So last question, it's infrastructure bill. Biden's infrastructure bill clearly will have a lot of support for rail. Um, we don't uh, in Maryland have, um, you know, ready plans, I think, um, to um, take advantage of that. Um, so what is our best chance here? Uh, I think uh, what we have to do is the the, the Biden transfer uh, transportation plan is not a two or three year plan. It's a 10 year plan. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is line up, get the planning going quickly so that we have projects that are ready to compete for all this uh, transportation construction money a couple of years down the road. And uh, that that really, uh, you know, we're now paying the price for the last uh, three years, four years fixation on these toll lanes at the expense of any planning, any expansion of transit. Yeah, and that's not going to happen before um, the, the Maryland gubernatorial elections, correct? Well, no, some of it can happen. Uh, there are two bills on the governor's desk right now. Uh, there's a, a, a bill uh, to uh, restart, to complete the planning of the light rail in Southern Maryland. Mm -hmm. And there's also a uh, the, the uh, Transit um, Safety and Investment Act uh, which is mostly about um, catching up with all the needed capital investments in the existing transit system around Baltimore. Uh, but it also has a provision to study extending Mark uh, up to Hagerstown or elsewhere in Western Maryland. What lessons can we draw from my conversation with Ben Ross and from the Don't Widen 270 protest? First, Governor Hogan's 2017 campaign promise to relieve traffic congestion in central Maryland and especially the suburban counties of Washington, D.C. has faced significant opposition and has had to be whittled down. His original plan included the Baltimore-Washington Parkway, which is a National Park Service property, and he was re rebuffed. Then, local leaders, especially in Montgomery County, rejected a highway-driven transportation solution and pushed for more transit. Residents along I-495, the Capitol Beltway, organized to push back against the governor's proposal. In the face of this opposition, he dropped the Capitol Beltway from his expansion plans. Now the truncated plan is a 20-mile stretch from the American Legion Bridge to, the Shady, to Shady Grove, mainly along Interstate 270. The problem with this plan is that while there is consensus that the American Legion Bridge will have to be replaced in the next 10 to 15 or even 20 years, the section of I-270, which will be widened and tolled, is not where the choke point is. The heaviest traffic congestion on I-270 is in its northern half, where it is a four-lane highway. In the southern part, which is slated for expansion, the highway has 12 lanes. Ben Ross explains this as part of the economic reality faced by the private toll company Transurban of Australia, which built and operates the toll lanes in the state of Virginia and now wants to expand the network throughout the region. In order for them to build more, however, they have to make money from the heaviest used and 
wealthiest, not necessarily the most congested parts of the regional highway system. Second, the Don't Widen 270 protest on June 8th gathered 150 people. It was a hastily organized event in the middle of a work day, and it was hot and teeming with cicadas. In comparison, the protest against the Beltway expansion routinely saw 750 attendees. Politics is consequentialist, and surely Governor Hogan, his Secretary of Transportation, Greg Slater, and their allies will be looking at the numbers who oppose them as they push ahead with their own plans. Activists insist that the grassroots support for Don't Widen 270 is as strong as the support for stopping the Beltway expansion. If that's the case, expect more and larger protests. Third, Maryland seems unprepared to take advantage of the Biden administration infrastructure spending initiative. There appear to be no ready projects for which to seek new infrastructure funds. In particular, the marked train service that connects Washington, D.C. to Frederick and beyond through Montgomery County. Montgomery County itself is asking for support for restarting the Purple Line construction and for three bus rapid transit lines. There are proposals for transit in Baltimore and trains in Southern Maryland, which are languishing as well. Ben Ross thinks there may be some movement with two bills in front of the governor right now, but I suspect a comprehensive transit plan will have to wait for a Democratic governor in Annapolis. The whisper in your name On the sidelines of the soccer game It sounds like you've been stepping on some toes They say you caused a panic Cause the snack you brought was not organic Veggie chips were made with GMOs That's all for this episode. We used original music from the Airport 77s, a Silver Spring band, Andy Sullivan on guitar, Chuck Dolan on bass, and John Kelly on drums. Their newest album, Rotation, is available on Spotify. They are playing today, June 11th, at the Sligo Creek Golf Course at 6 p.m. I'm very much looking forward to showcasing local talent and especially local music students on the podcast. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone who might, please email us at ihppod at gmail.com or reach out on Twitter at ihppod. I hope you will subscribe and share the podcast as we bring you stories about politics close to you and your home. See you next time. Spray that lemon spray